Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Uh, my name is Tim Patterson. Um, before I start talking, I wanted to get to know my audience a little bit. So, how many of you owned a microcomputer before the IBM PC came out in 1981? Okay, more than half. All right. How many of you have sometimes get down and dirty with a soldering iron? Ah, big group of there. And. Okay, the tough one, how many of you have programmed in assembly language? Ooh, whoa, okay. All right, I'm impressed. Well, I'm, I'm gonna start this story with kind of going uh, back with, it's where, I, where I'm coming from because I think it all, it all sort of flows together. Um, my, my father was an electrical engineer and his kits were a, a common feature of our household. Um, Eventually, you know, when I was old enough, I could have my own cider iron and I could build them too. Um, and he subscribed to magazines like Popular Electronics and Radio Electronics. And it's from one of those magazines that I first read about resistor transistor logic while I was in junior high. And I went out and got myself Don Lancaster's RTL cookbook, which got me started. I see heads nodding. Yes, that got me started in computer logic. By high school, I was building with TTL. Oh. This is a Southwest Technical Products DigiViewer. Let's, it's got an IC clip that lets you clip onto a, a, a digital chip, a TTL chip, and shows you what the, what the logic is doing. Uh, by the way, those guys later became um, 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 Microcomputer makers themselves. There's even a there's a 6800K system, 6800 system downstairs that I saw yesterday. So um, they did they did a lot of different stuff. One I remember one of the challenges of trying to make stuff in those days was just getting the data sheets. There was no internet. You you'd, you'd go and order parts, and you'd, I'd like to buy from the guys who would send you the data sheet for 25 cents more. Um, so in high school. I was, I built the darkroom timer, three Nixie tubes for readout. It's got memory, it's got a relay to turn the enlarger on and off. I'm not sure if it ever worked. This is what's left of it after 40 years. Um, <laughs> uh, note, I made my own circuit boards. They didn't have plated through holes, so I had to solder um, the chips on both sides of the boards to make a through, a through connection. So in high school, that also introduced me to computer programming. Um, I took a class in Fortran uh, as a junior. Um, there was a card punch machine in the classroom. Uh, you'd, you know, you'd punch up your program. The teacher would drive downtown once a week and run it on the Seattle Public Schools IBM System 360, and he'd wait for the results and get them back. So you had a nice one-week debug cycle. Uh, but uh, the passion was kindled. So I entered the University of Washington as, when I graduated, uh, and into, I went into the electrical engineering program following my father's footsteps. Uh, but the next year, when I was a sophomore, the UW created an undergraduate program for computer science. Now, they had had a graduate program for quite a number of years. And in fact, so one of the more famous graduates, you may have heard the name, Gary Kildall, 
graduated from the University of Washington uh, in about, I think, 71. Um, as a, so that sounded like me. I went for that. Um, so I immediately went from EE into co computer science. And uh, as, a, as a, one of the new recruits, I got a tour of the, um, the graduate co computer science lab uh, with their Xerox Sigma 7 computer. Um, and it's five megabyte fixed head disk, um, which was enough for all the graduates to share. Five megabytes, that's plenty. And then never saw it again. Yeah, those were the graduates. We were stunk, stuck in punched card hell for the next three years. <laughs> uh, well, all done, submitted to the, six, the CDC 6400 that the school owned. And uh, that's, that's how I learned to program. As part of being off at school, and I'm in, you know, living in, living in dorms, uh, I no longer was reading Dad's magazines, and I actually missed the introduction of the Altair in January '75 because I wasn't reading popular electronics. So it was, it was like there was something things happening, and I was out of the loop. Well, I got into the loop pretty pretty quickly because um, in I think February of '76, every year the University of Washington had a what was called the Terminal Fair. That was because you, people didn't buy computers. Computers were big things. People buy, bought terminals. And so there was an annual computer terminal fair. And I, in my first visit to the, this event, uh, there was a place there called the Retail Computer Store. And they had this Altair 8800 microcomputer. And in, inside of it was a Chromemco Dazzler that was showing all kinds of pretty color graphics on a, on a monitor. And it was so exciting that there was a computer that somebody could actually buy. And uh, so that was exciting. Now, it took a while for me to actually locate the store. They, there was a note in the door in the first place. No, we've moved to this other place. But we finally tracked them down after about a month. And they had the Altair there. But their guy said, oh, the Imzai is better. It's built better. It's, it's the machine you want. So within a month, my roommates and I had Gone for it. We 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 com uh, committed to buying the MSI. Of course, it was a matter of placing your order and waiting. And that's the stuff arrived a month later, all in kit form. Of course, you've got uh, the uh, of course pretty pretty well known look there. The, M the MSI 8080. That's 4.99. Now I'm thinking, hmm. I think maybe we had some upgrades. Like I think. We probably had to pay extra for the 22-slot motherboard. Sorry. Um, but uh, we also, this is what was inside of it at the time. The lower uh, right is the, is the CPU card. It's got the 8080 chip on it. Now, I'd ordered two 4K-byte IMSI RAM boards, but that they apparently didn't have them done yet, so because they didn't come when we asked when, we, when our main order did. So we, what's on the lower left there is the, a 4K processor technology memory board that we bought. You know, to get us by, you had to have some kind of memory. And let's see, the, that memory card was $139 for 4K bytes. Now today, memory I looked it up. It's about about $10 a gigabyte. So and that, that card's like $35 a kilobyte. So to put those in the same units, that's $35 million a gigabyte. <laughs> that's not adjusted for inflation. You adjust it for inflation, it's $150 million a gigabyte. <laughs> um, but we were happy to have it. Let's see. The upper left is the parallel I.O. card. And then the upper right is the, supposed to be an audio cassette interface, but that was a complete joke. It never worked. <laughs> So, uh, like I said, all kits, I assembled those stuff, I added a battery backup so that if we did have a program in it, nothing would, we wouldn't lose it because, like, that audio cassette inter interface didn't work, there was no way to save anything. Um, we had no I.O. except that the MSI, of course, had that row of eight lights and a row of switches, so what could we do with it? We could play Chase the Bit. <laughs> and that, if you, you know Chase the Bit? Rotating light in the screen, you flip the switch from the light side of the switches under the light. That was it. That was our, that was our total total functionality. But that didn't stop us. We loved having a computer. It was an exciting concept. 
when um, later that in, the, in like that summer, Chromemco came out with their four megahertz Z80 CPU card. Of course, we had to run out and buy that and upgrade. I mean, it wasn't plain taste a bit fast enough. <laughs> so when you're getting to move from two megahertz to four megahertz processor, well, finally things things did finally move along. Got went to the surplus floor, store, found this. This is actually two separate things. This keyboard was actually sort of part of some bigger piece that got chopped down to fit into that plastic housing. Um, and uh, this is what it's like underneath. It's all hand wired together and then, you know, one of those same little homemade, well, you know, homemade circuit boards where the chip soldered on both sides to get through, through the through holes. And uh, that 25 pin D connector uh, fed over to the parallel port card. So now we had some input. Output was a problem. This, then there was this ad, the adapter typer. It slides over a standard electric typewriter and turns it into a printer. An amazing concept. Here you could add a print output, you know, what, an ASR33 costs $1,300 or $1,500. Here, $250, you could have printed output. So we just sent up, sent the check, you know. We never heard of these guys, you know. You just mailed it off. You wait a few months, you wait a few months. The money came back. They never got them made. But they did refund our money. But it was a great idea. So at the same surplus store, Wallingford Surplus, just a bicycle ride away from the dorm, I saw, I saw a big pile of solenoids. So I built it myself with the help of my roommates. They're a little, a little rusty now, but those are spring steel strips. Each one connected to a solenoid. You can see the bank of, over on the right of transistor power drivers and the logic that was drove that. Underneath there's all those solenoids go into a common wiring board. Uh, and all this work that was done, the little pads, uh, the nails taped in some places to get the weight right. But this thing would actually type on my roommate's typewriter, power return, it would actually print it out. It worked. Uh-oh. Let's get that back. Okay, let's make sure it's not going to stop. Okay. All right. But, okay, so we've got, we've got a keyboard. We have come up with something for, uh, pr for output. Now, back in those days, paper tape was king. If you were going to buy a program, that was the only way you could buy it. There was, you got it on paper tape. Our Z80 CPU had come with the Chromemco resident operating system on paper tape. It was like a fan fold, about a half an inch thick. Uh, I think it took about 8K. Um, then we see October 1976, Byte Magazine. I, I added the red, a, a tape reader sensor. It's got nine little photo sensors that can line up with the nine holes in the paper, the, the, that paper tape that you see, you see all around here today. Nine line light sensors that line up for those holes. Um, obvious by that, roommate builds the plexiglass housing that gu guides the tape. I build a little electronic circuits to interface with the, uh, the optical sensors. And now we have our own paper tape reader connected to the parallel port. It was, it was wonderful. You could pull paper tape as fast as you could. <laughs> Got it every time. So, so then there's that, that magic moment where you toggle in the program to, to, to set up the paper tape load, pull the tape through of the Kremenko Ross, and then fire it up that first time and that typewriter starts clack. <laughs> Kremenko represents an operating system. It worked. It was amazing. It was awesome. <laughs> And of course, you never turn that off, and you battery back that up, because we're doing that again. All right. So, a friend of mine shows me this ad in the school newspaper looking for a computer technician. Well, the ad is from the retail computer store where we bought the computer from. They're the only computer store in Seattle. Um, so I apply. Gee, do I have any experience? Have I built a computer? Have I troubleshooted a computer? Yes, I get the job. Um, and I ride my bicycle there every day after classes. 
and you know the drop troubleshooting computers or they did a lot of building kits they they people would want to assemble a computer and you could typically order a kit or assembled with a pretty big price difference so they'd pay me like a quarter of what that price difference was you know you know paying by the hour in in their shop and you know they'd make a lot more money buying a kit selling assembled uh, tested by Tim uh, so computer store is also a great place where I kept up with the new products and and made the money to buy them so and buy them I did so first thing let's get some real output here the processor processor technology VDM one was was the gold standard of the time 16 rows of 64 characters on your monitor um, of course we didn't have a, what, what you call a mo is that me we didn't have what you'd call a real monitor. We had a 23-inch black-and-white console TV, a little modification, a hole drilled in the side, and a video jet came out. Uh, sat up on the windowsill. You could see it from 15 feet. Um, processor, processor technology had some great games. They had Target, Trek 80. Uh, another guy wrote Air Traffic Controller. We love these games. I wasn't a big gamer myself, but... Um, my roommates were, so we had to uh, come up with the second keyboard to play multiplayer games. You know, both players looking at the same screen, but two keyboards. Uh, then, um, but then, you know, keeping up, making some money, the big step, a floppy disk drive. Oh, this is actually where life begins. So, obviously, pull those tapes through, storm the disk, and that's why the paper tape reader is the one thing I couldn't show you a picture of because it it never made it, <laughs> it never made it out of college. Like all these other everything else I'm showing you is a picture I've taken in the past two weeks. But um, that's you know that was long forgotten once we had a floppy disk. Ah, oh, it changed everything. Eighty nine thousand six hundred bytes. Could you imagine? Um, so, uh, in a little side story, I guess. Um, my roommate and I were really interested in road rally, and road rally is where you're, you're driving around with a set of instructions trying to figure out exactly where, to be, where you're supposed to be, and you're trying to stay on time. They give you a speed, you're supposed to stay on exactly on time, and there were guys that had road rally computers that helped them do that. So what do we do is take the MZI, plop it in the back seat with an inverter, plop, you know, North Star disc on top, the... Uh, Monitor mounted in the dash, running Northstar Basic. Uh, there was a, a a little drive mounted on the front wheel that went under the hood. An optical sensor that watched the wheel spin around, and the whole thing that came together. And we had our our maybe it's first portable computer, probably the first portable computer with a floppy disk. I don't know if you call it portable. Portable requiring a car to move it. Um, Anyway, to continue on some of the I.O. we started to add, the joystick from the surplus, floor, surplus store, where we, we added the, the bicycle grip as part of it. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, now, uh, my roommates, were, well, one roommate in particular was, was actually starting to write games. Start, the movie Star Wars had come out, and he, had, he actually had a shooting game where he'd use the joystick and, and shoot at the, the fighters that were coming straight at you. Um, the big one was this, this, this cost more than everything we've put money on so far, about $1,500 for this chassis of a Cume Daisy Wheel printer. Now we finally had output that was so clean and crisp you could turn it into your teacher this way. Um, and uh, so that, uh, that was like the, the crowning achievement of my computer, my college computer inventory. So, oh, and there's the electronic control box that I had to build. Notice I've moved on from making circuit boards now. I'm finally using wire wrap for one-offs. Uh, much simpler way to go. Um, so working at the computer store, the store sold 16K byte memory boards from a company called Seattle Computer Bro Products. And 
their owner, Rod Brock, might stop by and you know, sell, sell more stuff. And I, one day I come out and I complain to him. We, we tried to build a 64K system, one with four memory boards using his, his product. And not that I know what, what anybody could use with that much memory. It didn't make any sense. 64K, that's more than anybody would ever want to use. But anyway, when we put four, four of his memory boards in one system, it didn't work. Um, well, I did some troubleshooting and I found some design issues. It, they, they, they weren't very well designed. Um, well, was, that was just probably shortly before I was going to graduate because upon my graduation, June of 78, he offered me a job at Seattle Computer. Uh, I had my Bachelor of Science, Computer Science, and he, uh, he, paid, he gave, gave me $50 a day to fix the design of his memory boards. So. I designed a new memory board for him, and right away said, hey, okay, I like it. Offered me a full-time job, a nice pay raise, you know, a real engineering type salary, and that started my career with Seattle Computer Products. So this was in June of 78, and Intel has, is just announcing their 8086 16-bit processor. Um, now, at this point, Seattle Computer Products only has the one product, memory boards, but Rod says, hey, go, go check it out. So um, they had, there was a seminar late in June for, you know, in the Seattle area, Bellevue or something, um, you know, come in, learn, hear about the processor, uh, pick up the data book. Uh, this data book is like less than a quarter inch thick, but that's what they had. Um, and it's like, wow, this is great. It's cool. Uh, and the boss says, well, you know, in your spare time, go ahead and, and work on designing a 16-bit computer. And just by a, a miracle of coincidence, just a month before the May issue of Computer Magazine, published by the IEEE, that had the idea of a, a standardizing the S100 bus, that, which is what all these computers, the MZIs and the Altairs and everything, we were all S100 computers standardizing it, including an extension for 16 bits. It's like, what could be better? Here, I've just learned about a 16-bit processor. I've just learned that we could make the S100 bus go 16-bit. And the boss has said, go ahead and design the computer. So um, I had other things I was doing, but I worked on it some. and. Uh, it took about six months. In January of 79, I had uh, a first, you know, here's the design. And it, um, as the standard discussed, it could work with 8-bit memory, which would hold the processor while the, the, while the circuitry on the board went, grab those two bytes. Or it could use 16-bit memory, get them all at once. Um, so the standard was, is, uh, was a... It was fabulous to have this, you know, definitive document on here's how you're supposed to do that. So besides designing this CPU card, there was also what I called the support board. And it had a, a spot for a ROM. It had some serial and parallel I.O. It had interrupts. It had a timer. Um, so we had what we thought could, you know, be built into a complete system. And uh, so, okay, we're ready to go. The design's complete. We didn't. I didn't prototype. When I built it, it usually worked. So we sent it straight to the taper, the taper being the guy who laid the tape that was used to lay out a printed circuit board. You know, he took twice the size of what the circuit a set of a 5 by 10 inch S100 card. It was a 10 by 20 inch. And red tape and blue tape represented each side of the board, and he'd lay out the, the circuitry. Well, um, let's see. OK. So during this time, actually, I was still going to the UW. I graduated, and I was going to graduate school. I was uh, checking out, you know, getting a master's in computer science. And one of the projects I worked on, well, I took, was taking a course in OS, and I had to do some kind of term project. And so I wrote a multitasking operating system for the Z80 as part of what uh, and 
improved its specifications and uh, efficiency and stuff. But I found working in industry to be much more interesting than going to classes. So eventually, as, as the, the, year, the school year dragged on, I ended up by the third quarter uh, dropping all my classes and just spent full time at Seattle Computer Products after that. So I was done with school. I continued to live in the dorm till, till the, I, as long as I could, but because um, uh, it was cheap. But I was not even going to school anymore. Well, so we've got the taper working. We're, we're the boards, boards are, you know, they go off to fabrication. There's, there's this delay, you know, okay, I've done the design. You know, it's going to be a little while before we get some hardware. So let's, let's start working on the software. Well, there's no way to program it. Of course, all, all programming in microcomputers was basically done in um, assembly language. There's not even an assembler for the 8086, at least not one that, I know about or I can get access to. So that's the starting point. I got to write the assembler. So I write an, the assembler in Z80 assembly language for the 886. So it runs on Cormemco CDOS, which is just their CPM clone. So in other words, it's a CPM program. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, but it allows me to finally write some 8086 code. So now that I've got that, I, I've got, I know I've got this uh, 2K of ROM that I've put, made space for on that CPU support card. Uh, so I start writing the ROM monitor. And that includes a, a little mini debugger and then the boot command, which just loads the first sector of a floppy disk and runs it. Gets, gets your whatever's on the floppy started up. So in April of 79, we had the hardware. The boards were back. And it, it took a while to get it all worked out. Uh, there were some bugs. The, the taper had made a mistake, and he'd swapped a couple of pins. So we had these wire wrap sockets where we, because it was easier than cutting and, and wiring on the board, we'd taken the, the pin, the long the end inch pins, the wire wrap sockets, and we twisted around. So that as they came down, they spun 180 degrees, and they went into the into the opposite pins of socket. So there were about six, four or six chips in the board that were like up on these little pedestals, um, getting getting themselves wired right. But it, it got going. Oops, skip the page. And once it's working, um, Microsoft. Okay, this is January '79. Microsoft has just has just moved from Albuquerque to to Bellevue. You know, hey guys, do you got any 8086 software? Eh, not yet, not yet. But in, by May, um, they do. They give us a call back. Hey, we've got our standalone basic, disk basic, ready to test on our 8086. So I load up the system in the car and bring it up to Bellevue um, and pull it out. And Bob O'Rear is, is uh, the Microsoft guy I'm working with who gets this, get this thing going. Um, he got it, you know, I get him set up, he's debugging. It took about two weeks for him to get basic going, but it was, it was actually pretty amazing how much of it, when, when he, when he first, first fired it up, it was like, things worked. It was kind of amazing. It's like, oh, that's all the stuff's working. Arithmetic didn't work, but you know, it crashed, but a lot of stuff worked. And the reason for that was because of the the co compatibility that Intel had put in between the 8080 and the 8086. This is from that first manual I showed you. For every 8080 instruction, is what, which is what basic, Microsoft Basic was ri originally written in, there was one or a few 8086 instructions that did the same thing. So there was a translation rule. And for most of Microsoft Basic, they just did these? Did this? They they just did the rules, and that's why it all worked because the rules worked for things that were important like the arithmetic things like that. That was all written from scratch. But um, so that's what that, that's where all the debugging was. But this translation really made things um, a lot simpler. And since I did see a lot of assembly language programmers out here, I'll, let me mention Microsoft's development environment. Um, they used a DEC 2020 timeshare computer, but 
basic, of course, is written in assembly language. Um, but they don't, they're not using an 8080 assembler or a Z80 assembler. They're using the DEC assembler with a macro package. So, so they run the standard DEC assembler with you know, loading this macro package. And there's different ones. There's one, OK, this one, this one converts, converts it to generates 8080 code. Oh, well, this one gener will generate Z80 code. They actually started to mod add new macros that were like hybrids. For instance, um, suppose you wanted to load a 16-bit value. Well, of course, in the 8080 code, that would be load an 8-bit value and then load the second 8 bits. So they create a new macro that, loaded, that was for loading a 16-bit value, and it would generate, when they read it, did the 8080 version, it would generate some one piece, the two pieces of code, and when it was the 80, for 8086, it would generate the one. So they ended up with this sort of hybrid conglomeration assembly language that had all these versions of mnemonics that weren't, didn't belong to anything, that just helped them have one single source code for every version of BASIC. So anyway, we've got this BASIC working. This is May. Well, in June of 1979 comes the National because, because the National Computer Conference, and this is this is what there was before there was Comdex. Um, and Microsoft invites me to bring the 8086 computer to show off BASIC 86. Um, uh, the booth actually belonged to Lifeboat Associates, uh, which was a big software distributor that you know they. They, they had offered to share it with Microsoft, and they're a little, not quite sure why I'm there, but um, anyway, we're in a, but this is before, you know, this is the National Computer Conference. We're just stuck in a basement. Nobody's coming down there. Nobody on top of that is coming and seeing in this corner, there's an 8086 basic running there. You know, it's the first example of it ever, but okay, nobody knows. Um, while I'm there, this, one of the guys from Microsoft, uh, Mark McDonald, tells me about an OS he's working on. And um, it uses a system called the file allocation table. Now, and that's what's used in the disk basic that we're, we're demonstrating, the file allocation table. Now, if you've heard about, may have heard about FAT. Um, MS-DOS orig originally shipped with FAT12. And later, Microsoft came out with FAT16, and later came out with FAT32 as disks got bigger. So what was used in standalone, if we were going to use that terminology, what was used in standalone basic would be called FAT8. Um, Mark's idea was he was going to make the FAT size ch change to whatever it needed to be to be perfect for that size disk. So there could be a FAT9 or a FAT11. This, this number refers to the number of bits that are used for each, to, to, for each allocation unit in the table. So it's like, oh, OK, well, that's an interesting idea. So ex explain to me how, how this fat thing worked, and he had his ideas. Um, so I was really, OK, all very cool. Well, so let's see here. There's our ad. We first shipped our CPU card in, I think, November of 1979. This is, actually, I, I checked and I found that this ad was actually run, also run in October. Um, see, it wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't cheap. Um, got uh, like $1,200 or something for those first two cards. Um, so we got the 8086 CPU card. And then the CPU support card I talked about has the ROM and the IO and timer and you know, like those connections across the top or a serial IO parallel in and a parallel out. Um, and we've got our 16-bit memory card to go with it. Um, and, and of course, we now have Microsoft standalone disk basic to run on it. So that card was designed to run at 8 megahertz. But unfortunately, the 8 megahertz chip wasn't ready yet. And so we had to ship it at just running at 4 megahertz. Because um, it, it had a 4 8 megahertz switch. So it couldn't, you could get a 5 megahertz chip, but I couldn't, couldn't, that wasn't one of the options. Now, Seattle Computer didn't do the case. They didn't do 
um, any of the any other I/O. This is really all you needed was a, a case and power supply uh, to get something going. But they didn't do the rest of that. Being all S100, you know, you're supposed to source that somewhere else. Um, but okay, our only software was Disk Basic. It's mostly really 8-bit. It's not fully optimized. Um, when our CPU is running at 4 megahertz and you're using 8-bit memory, it ran about as fast as a 4 megahertz C80. When we got to the 8 megahertz CPU and you were using 16-bit memory, it ran about three times faster. So it's a pretty good speed boost, but still, it's just basic. It's not, you know, it's not like the 880ZA computers. They've got CPM. They got a zillion programs out there. It's just like the app market today for, for your phones, you know? It's, it's, everybody's going crazy making more applications for CPM. We had nothing. So we know we need something like CPM for 8086 computers. Um, we'd actually talked to Digital Research briefly in the summer bef before we started shipping. Um, they were working on a CPM 86 target end of 79. All right. They even asked if we could, they could use our prototype, but we didn't have one to spare. Um, but in December, you know, the end of the year rolled around, we never saw CPM 86 coming out. Well, I was no big fan of CPM anyway. It's what, what I used basically by using Kremco CDOS, that was a CPM clone. Um, it really bugged me that when you're using CPM, you're always rebooting. Every time you change disk, you control C and reboot. When a program ends, you control C and reboot. So you always had to have a system disk in the drive. And it was slow. The, um, you know, a, a floppy disk, the eight inch floppy disks, spin six revolutions a second. But it took CPM six revolutions to read a single track of the disk. It should have taken just one. So it took it a whole second to read one track of the disk because of their interleave factor, as it was. Um, they also had a very poor programming interface. They forced the application writer to deal with, you had, you, when you're doing file L, you, you had to do it in terms of the physical sector size of the disk, 128 bytes. That was, that was all they knew about. And, ah, well, let me, uh, I wasn't happy. So, I make a pitch. They, they're not ready, they don't have anything out there. How about I write it, boss? We need something quick. I've written an OS before, wrote it in college. I can do much higher performance in, in CPM. And I got this idea about making it translation compatible. Remember the chart I showed you? The idea was you could, the, the people, who, you, the owners of a, you know, the publishers of a program could take their source code, run it through that translation process. And when you did that, okay, here was, say here was the sequence, these three instructions are what caused CPM to say open a file. Well, when you translated that, those translated instructions would be the instructions that would cause my operating system to open the file. So it would just translate and be ready to go right out of the box. Um, so applications would be easily ported by their authors and, uh, you know, it, it, and it, as a designer, it made it really easy for me to figure out my, what I was going to design. I had, I had the, the manuals for CPM. It's like, okay, you translate that, you end up with this. Here's the design I want to use for what I'm going to write. Well, honestly, that's a crappy interface. I mean, I've been complaining about CPM as it is. Um, but, so I've got this plan. You know, this is, that's just the quick and dirty. Uh, that's just to get us by. I have this plan. I'm going to go, go back, do it right, do it the way it's supposed to, come out with a single user version, multi user version. Yeah, it's all better. As if you could change the way when things that are entrenched. I know. I was only 24. I was stupid. So, but the boss, trust me, he gives me the go ahead. I start work on an operating system. So, it's kind of a, you know, I got a lot, a lot going on. I'm, I'm the, the main engineer there. You know, we're shipping all kinds of stuff. So I'm, I'm working on it half the time. But so in April, I get, of 1980, I get started working on this quick and dirty operating system. Uh, I happen to, one day, it, it just, like, uh, I'm thinking about things. It's like, oh, I really like the way Northstar Basic lets you edit a line, your previous line. So I start working on the, 
input buffering you know, from the console. Oh, I'll start doing that. And then I asked, okay, I said, let me think about disk formats. You know, how do I want to store it? Let's see. North Star disks. And then there was a system called the UCSDP system um, that had, had a short burst of popularity. They, they put stuff on disk in one continuous block. Problem with that was, once something got written behind it, it got really hard to make that any bigger. That was a real problem. You had to go move it, the whole thing somewhere else. So that, was, that wasn't a candidate. And, you know, I've, I've been using CPM. I know how it does its thing. It's got these, these extents of 16 K bytes each. And, uh, in college, I had a one hour class on how C Unix did it. Never used Unix myself, never seen it, but I had one hour of here's how it does it. So, okay, that's an idea. But there's this fat, the file allocation table that Mark McDonald told me about. It's like, it never requires, so everything, everything else, well, except the North, North Star that I've rejected, everything else might require you reading the disk in order to know where to read the disk. You gotta hit it twice. Never happens with the file allocation table. Now, I'm not sold on, sold on Mark's idea, this variable bit thing. And so I gotta get the size right. Now, the biggest drive, Chromemco is just, at this point, has just come out with this gigantic 11 megabyte hard disk drive. It's huge, it's expensive. I don't know how, how anybody's ever gonna afford it. But if I use a 12 bit file allocation table entry, that's good for 64 me up to 64 megabytes. You could even push that to a 120 megabyte storage device. And by using a 16 bit sector count, that also could be pushed to 128 megabytes. So that should be good forever, right? Nobody would ever need more than 128 megabytes of storage. I mean, they're never going to make that big. So I'm good. And the beauty of it is, so I've, I've you know, I've, I've future proofed it, and and it only takes 6K of RAM and the worst case for the, for that biggest disk size. So so I got it all figured out. So my development environment here is I'm running on a Z80 CPU running CDOS, the CPM clone. My editor is MicroPro WordMaster, the predecessor of the famous MicroPro WordStar. Um, I'm using my cross assembler, so it runs on the Z80, writes it to the disk, and then I uh, have to get that moved over to a disk that can, that the, um, my ADA6 can read. So I write that code to the boot section of the disk, and then I've got my little ROM that I've burned on the 886 to, to debug the code that uh, I've, just, I've just written to try out my operating system. Um, so the first QDOS was functional about the end of July 1980. It was called QDOS. I was calling it QDOS 0 0.1. Um, of course, it was never calling it Q. So, the fact that I've called it QDOS has, has prompted in press that I've seen you know, that Seattle Computer sold a thing called QDOS. Well, Seattle Computer did not sell a thing called QDOS. That was, that's like calling Windows 95 Chicago. That's what we called it in the, in the house. It was never out the door that way. Um, this ad is, is from August 1980. And if you think about things like press deadlines and stuff, this probably had to be submitted by June. So this has to be before, I, I only just, I forgot all about this. I was just looking at this this little week. It's like, wow, this had to be submitted before I was ever done, before I even had, had a first working. So in, but from the get-go, Rod Brock was calling it 86 DOS. So that price there, that 1385, that's, that's that same individual price for that CPU card, the CPU support card, plus this $95 he's talking about for the um, for 86 DOS. That's what that's added together. And now, supposedly, you know, you now, and then you take your Z80 programs, you run it through the translator, and um, oh, I guess I didn't mention that. I actually part of part of the what I was part of the software I did was. I finally just sat down and wrote a source code translator that took Z80 source code and spat out 86 source code according to those same rules. So this was, okay, 
you could you can get your stuff on the 886. And as as we found, even just dead translated stuff ran at least twice as fast. You know, because we had such a high clock speed and we were getting 16 bits. But just a few months later, the pricing came, came much more sensible here. Now this is both of those cards. What was 1385 is now 595. Uh, that's both the CPU, the CPU support card, and DOS all bundled together. Um, this ad also actually this is this one's dated I think November, but it also ran in October. So we're out there. We've got our DOS. We've got our okay. So. Microsoft gives us a ring. Hey, we got this customer who might be interested in DOS. It's like, okay, can you tell us anything about that? No, no, it's, it's all very hush-hush, but uh, we'd like to be able to resell DOS. Okay, so we sign a deal. They can't remember exactly how it goes. There was $25,000 was involved. Something like, that's all, I mean, that's all it amounted to in the end anyway, so. It was either $10,000 up front and $15,000 for every customer you signed up, or $15,000 up front and $10,000 for every customer you signed up, one or the other. So they, they paid us Seattle Computer $25,000, and we had no idea who it was. And I keep going about finishing working on 86 DOS per my original design. And the main thing, which was a huge amount of work, was um, making the programmer's interface that you know people writing applications making that not have to see the physical interface of the disks, which CPM did. So um, separating the physical from the API. Anyway, so I, I get all that going. Plus, Microsoft's coming to us with, here's some things that this, our customer wants. Um, it was, wasn't a big list. It was a lot of, a lot of weenie stuff, a lot of, but, one of, but one of the things was batch files. So, you know, that turned out to be a pretty good idea. Um, so... You know, we work on this thing, and um, like, yeah. Then in May, uh, so I got this thing. I what I called DOS. You know, so I, as I mentioned I, before, I'd call it uh, zero point one. So when I call it, when I'm calling one point oh, it's got everything I, I intended. That that was done about the end of April, and about the same time, for unrelated reasons. I left Seattle Computer and I went to work for Microsoft. And when I started there on May 1st, um, there it is. I get to find out it's IBM is that customer. Like, okay, big deal. I had no idea what they might be capable of. And the, you know, there's there's no um, there's no standard by which the microcomputer business was <laughs> would would be able to judge how that was going to go. So it's like, okay, they, you know, we'll see. Um, so I, and it was my buddy Bob O'Rear, the standalone basic guy. He was the one doing, making the DOS I'd written run on the IBM machine. So I helped him out, eventually just took over from him. I was, became the, um, doing the last customizations, uh, just touching up. And then just a few months later, you know, well, you had to reach code complete, you know, like in probably the, by the 1st of July, and IBM spins a month testing it and banging on it, making sure it's right, and then I think it, uh, August 11th, so it was, uh, they announced it to the public, and, our, and DOS was out there. And at that, you know, and with my with my work at on DOS at Microsoft done, I switched over to the basic compiler team for the 8086 at Microsoft, and I cruised along doing that for a while, and then when that was done. IBM is coming back. Said, "Okay, we've, it's time for a new, the next revision in DOS. We need, we want a DOS 1.1." Um, and oh, well, during the summer, um, just shortly after DOS was all finished and sent off to IBM, Microsoft starts talking to Seattle Computer Products. Hey, we think, we think this could go somewhere, but th 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 whatever that was, it's fifteen thousand dollars a customer. We can't wheel and deal like we want. We need to be able to, to set our own pricing. And so they made, that's when the, the agreement to buy 86 DOS from Seattle Computer by Microsoft was done. So I was, an, I was an employee of Microsoft. I was a shareholder of Seattle Computer. 
Uh, I wasn't an executive of either one, but when, but when that deal was being finalized, Paul Allen and Brock Brock brought me into the room just to say, hey, here's what we're doing. Got any thoughts? And it sounded like a good deal to me. So the deal, you know, SCP isn't a software company, especially without, not, without me there. They're, um, so they're not going to make turn it into anything. They get, 50, I think they got $50,000 cash. They got to use it, which is more than they paid me to write it, by the way. Um, the Seattle computer got to use it for free, forever, to license with their computers. They got a discount on Microsoft software. So, sounds good to me, and we have no idea what's gonna, where it's going to go. Um, so, now, IBM's, or Microsoft's in control of, of DOS. IBM is asking for 1.1. I don't know, so I'm working on changes and, and, and also, okay, we have, I'm a Microsoft guy, I've got to come up with the version for all the other companies. I don't remember who was first, you know, there's the, the Compax and the Zeniths and, and the other guys when we want to come out with a, some 8086 computer. Not necessarily an IBM clone that then, um, but they've heard about, well, they've heard about it partly because in March we went on, did a road show, took, went to, the gang, I was, and I spoke at a little conference in New York and one in San Francisco saying, oh, here's this operating system, um, put it on anything. Um, so uh, we're putting the word out that we, that Microsoft had a 16-bit operating system. Well, um, about that time, uh, I'm thinking, you know, here at Microsoft, I'm this, I'm this big. <laughs> And at Seattle Computer, I've got, I'm a factor. I get to, I get to guide where it's going to go. I get to be part of, you know, feel like I'm, so I decided I'm going to want to be part of this, I want to be part of that smaller company. I go back to Seattle Computer Products in, what, May, what was it? April of 1982. Um, so from that point on, I had no more contact with DOS. So I'd finished, oh. So in, in March, finished DOS 1.1. If you look at this, what IBM shipped as DOS 1.1 is the 1.24, the second to the last line of the revision history. And then there was one more change made that made it 1.25. And that's what the sign on was for the com compacts and the Zenus, they had 1.25. Yeah. You can actually get a pretty good view of the history. For instance, like, oh, I, you know, I left, I mentioned having, you know, when I went from Seattle Computer to Microsoft, there's 1.00 in there at April 28th, because essentially that's my last day at Seattle Computer Products. Uh, so uh, then the changes after that, are stuff I did at Microsoft. And of course, Seattle Computer was being updated, you know, it's theirs. Um, so, after that, Microsoft was off on the, doing it themselves. I did get one call while they're working on DOS 2.0 from one of the guys, he's actually worked with me on, on doing the DOS 1.1, Aaron Reynolds. He said, Tim, I got a question about the Tim code. Tim code, what's Tim code? Well, that's the code we haven't figured out yet. So it's doing this and this and this. Oh, that's crap. Take it all out. <laughs> that's why you haven't figured it out. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. But um, a lot later, many, many years later, um, some guy at, a, at somebody's, at, I think it was Bob O'Rear's retirement party, came up to me and said, love the way I did the time of day keeping. It was still in Windows 95. Oh, wow. Okay. 15 years later. So it's probably not in anything anymore. But. So um, I did go back to work at Microsoft in the late 1980s, and then again in the 1990s. I was mostly working on Visual Basic, but that was the end of my, my DOS career. So that's, that's my story, how, how DOS came about. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask any now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm.
<laughs> yes. Pardon me? Uh, question is, did I ever meet Gary Kildall? And the answer is not in person. However, in the 1980s, he called me up, he looked me up in directory assistance and called me up at home in order to tell me that I had ripped off CPM. And I said, well, today we would call it implementing an interface. We do this all the time. You know, somebody publishes an interface, you can use the interface and you can implement the interface. Back then, there was, um, everybody who wanted to come out with IBM PC, for instance, had to have implement the interface of the IBM ROM BIOS. Your, your clone, your IBM clone wouldn't work without it. So, I, but IBM had very nicely published the interface, of course, so people could use it. And if they published it, then people can write new code. Now, some people, Corona, Eagle, they thought the shortcut was, well, just copy IBM's. And IBM put a step on their throat and said, no. Uh, everybody else said, well, we'll write our own. And everybody in the computer industry thought, that's fine. If you write your own implementation, you're doing, you know, that's okay. It's just copying the code is what's not okay. So I basically make that argument, you know, except DOS is different because it's not, you know, it's 16-bit versus 8-bit. It's not, you know, the same. And the, the function is different. I'm using file allocation tape, you know, it's, so how, you know, so I don't get it exactly, but you ripped off CPM. So, um, so I spoke with him once. And that's, uh, that's been a, it's, you know, something in, in his camp that's apparently never been forgiven. But any other questions? Yeah. Whenever I heard that tale of Microsoft buying DOS $50,000, it seems like that tale often told uh, you know, the connotations that Microsoft got away with, like highway robbery. And I'm just wondering, in, in, in the time that came afterward, did you or did the owner of Seattle find a very good sense that, that you felt ran or misgiving and did it in need? So the, the question is, was was the deal for between my, Seattle Computer and Microsoft, we feel it was, in retrospect, we feel it's fair. And I absolutely do. Microsoft made DOS what it was. Seattle Computer wasn't going to turn into a powerhouse. Microsoft marketed the heck out of it. They improved, you know, DOS 2.0, that was finally doing what I said, you know, getting from quick and dirty to here's to do it right way, you know, kind of a Unix style of API. Um, they're the ones that turned it into that. They marketed it. They built it. I'd only written, DOS consisted of 6K of code. <laughs> How much do you expect to pay for that? Uh, you know, Seattle Computer wasn't going to do anything with it. So uh, to me, it's, it's, it's always been perfectly fair deal. They, they're the ones that ran with it. They're the ones that made it what it was. If, they, if that deal hadn't been done, we'd be living in a different world. And if I hadn't written it at all, it's like hard to think exactly where Microsoft, you know, how much would that have changed Microsoft's course? But, um, but no regrets and no feeling that there's, you know, there wasn't a good deal. I mean, they were taking a risk and they, they paid what it was worth. Um, and they, you know, they were able to do something with it. Uh, so uh, I've never felt that it, uh, it was a bad deal. Um, IBM knew where DOS came from. They even called once and then went, oh, wait, we're not supposed to talk to you. You know, because that would let us letting the cat out of the bag. You know, because, you know, they don't have the non-disclosure with Seattle Computer. So, um, you know, they knew. I, I, one of the, one of the, somebody came up to me and told me he was writing the manual for IBM and it included the Seattle Computer logo in the documents they got. So, um, yeah, that was no secret at any point. I mean, we're the only ones who had an operating system. It was advertised. This was it. So, it was a question. Well, that's it. Oh, one more. So, you know, as in the 80s and 90s, as the IBM compatible standard became the consumer popular choice of computing, did you, was that your main? I guess it's two part question. One, did the advances in DOS became 
five, six, did, did they totally impress you that you thought that's cool and they added that? And, and two, was there, you know, you always have a sense of satisfaction in using that product and all the Uh, a quick question. It's hard to summarize, but uh, the uh, so I wouldn't say that there was anything in particular in DOS that I was. I, I became a, once I was separate from DOS. It was it was a clean divorce. I was just another user. Um, I didn't particularly like. I was an earlier adopter of you know fairly early adopter of Windows. I didn't I didn't like the command line especially. I didn't I didn't stay on that. I I thought. I was aghast that IBM kept Edlin. Uh, that was, you know, that was just something I whacked out because, you know, here I'm, I'm if I'm going to claim to have a machine you can develop an 886 program on, you got to have some way of typing it in. So I spent like less than one week coming up with that because, you know, anyway, um, I, I drift from the point there, which was I just just became another user and, you know, what 1990 I became a Windows user and. Um, so, you know, I just kind of I left DOS left DOS behind. Uh, so, what was the second part of your question? Oh, um, well, you know, it's it is yes. I'm proud of having had a an impact. Um, it's you know, it's been a pretty big impact for from what 1982 to the mid 90s it's the most widely used computer program in the world and i wrote the first version i didn't write the version that was being that was the being used but i wrote what got it all started so yes there's 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 pride in that um, but uh, it's like it's a pretty early peak it's uh, you know all done when i'm 24 <laughs> um, i've had a lot of fun since and and i i mean i have a lot of pride in my work i spent a lot of time in visual basic i made it the fastest interpreter it could be and um, i was you know, in the mid '90s, Intel had two um, two math bugs in like the, in their 486 chip. I was the guy they talked to about that. You know, we were the we we're like we were the only ones using interrupt-driven exceptions in Visual Basic and stuff like that. So we we were, um, you know, I guess what I, I guess all I'm saying is I've had other feelings of success that aren't you know artists. Widely seen, but um, you know, I didn't didn't bother taking it. I have two ship it plaques from Microsoft, each with five row, you know, two rows of five, uh, twenty awards on it <laughs> for all all the all the stuff I got out. So uh, it's been a it's been a long career. I've had a good time. Yes. Yeah, what I worked on at Microsoft. So, um, in I went, I had a two-year stint at Microsoft from '88, let's see, '86 to '88. During that t entire time, I was working on Quick Basic. Um, then I left for a year, and I came back in 1990. From 1990 to 1998, I was at Microsoft again, and I spent nearly all that on Visual Basic, which was just, you know, the same, you know, the Quick Basic source code now running on Windows, basically. Um, so. Uh, that's nearly all of. Uh, then at the very end, I was doing work on uh, Java. I was writing the, helping the right. I was help, helping make Sun mad by making changes to Java that we were not allowed to make <laughs> uh, because of our. It was like, like, it's like Microsoft hadn't read the contract. No, we're not allowed to go add new things. But I was adding new things because they told me to. So, um, and that's. And that's what spawned .NET is because they actually Microsoft loved Java. They thought this was a great creation, and Sun wouldn't let them do anything with it. So it's like, okay, we have to start from scratch, and you know, do all the same things, but then we can go, you know, go so much further. And so um, .NET got started right after I left. Uh, I, I mean, I was in meetings in 1997, and I, I left in '98. I was in meetings talking about how are we going to do. They were actually just talking about can we do basic with the Java with Java P code. It's like, no, nah, man, we can't make it work. We just we just got to come up with our own. So anyway, um, so Visual Basic, it's a little bit of Java. 
Oh, one more question back here. Pardon me? The, the ROM BIOS? I'm sorry. I I didn't have anything to do with IBM's ROM BIOS. They, that was something that was all in place when I got there. Um, so um, I did, you know, actually years later, I was one of those guys that wrote a ROM BIOS clone. It was used in Hyundai computers, but um, I didn't have anything to do with the design of the BIOS. Uh, Okay, so our CPU support card had a ROM on it, but that was basically to boot up. And so, you know, IBM was, there's, you know, they were, they were famous for only being able to have, make, build the machines out to 640K. That ROM we had only took up 2K at the very end. You could make a one megabyte machine out of, in 1979, you could build a one megabyte 886 machine if you had enough memory. Well, I guess you couldn't put that many memory cards. Not until we came out with a 64K card could you build a one megabyte machine. Uh, and in fact, for most of the 1980s, Microsoft kept a one megabyte um, Seattle computer machine because that's the only thing that could link the linker. Because they didn't have, this was before you know, this is, it, was, it was all running real mode. Um, it, was, it was all, they didn't, you know, they didn't have virtual memory. They didn't have 32-bit versions of anything in the 80s. And so this thing needed so much memory that they had this one box. It had 16 64K memory cards, you know, 8 megahertz Seattle computer CPU, uh, and that little ROM BIOS to start it up with. It may have even, I think, it, I think it actually faded out after boot. It actually disappeared and gave you the higher to one megabyte. Um, so that, that was just, just a boot ROM. And I, what I didn't understand about IBM's ROM BIOS is the Intel manuals clearly, you mentioned, I, you mentioned interrupts. The, the Intel manuals clearly stated every interrupt below 20 hex is reserved. And here they are, boom, we're going to stick things on those interrupts. And it's like later processors, you stuck this thing right on top of the, the fault for this. It's like, why don't you read the book? <laughs> there's lots of things they didn't read the book on. I, the, the whole reason there's a 160K format is because they didn't read, a bu read the book. It's like, we were using the same format at Seattle Computer, except it was nine sectors instead of eight sectors. It was 180K. So I, when I came to Microsoft from Seattle Computer, I said, why are your disks only 160K? I said, well, I don't know. That's what we thought we were to have. There's room for nine sectors. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, well, you know, it's, we're coming out in three months, so we'll put that in the next version. We don't want to try it now. So that's the reason we end up with so many frickin' disk formats, because they're just, it's like, you know, we're down in there, you know, we, we made disk cards, we've, yeah. Uh, in fact, I want to mention Pat Opalka. He worked, he was two years behind me in, in school. He worked at the retail computer store. He came to work for me at Seattle Computer Products. I went and started, I got to mention, I started my own company. I had my own company for a few years. It wasn't particularly successful. He worked for me there for three years. He's uh, just a top flight engineer. And um, so he was, he was one of the guys down in there, like, figuring this stuff out. You know, how much time is there on the surface as disk trans goes around a circle and blah, 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 blah the disk transfer rates and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay. Any, anyway, any, any more questions? Any more questions? Yes? Since you were at Microsoft in the early years, and you said later, or period you used the 80s and 90s, did you interact much with Bill Gates? And what was your impression of what was in those days? Well, the question was, did I interact much with Bill Gates? And just occasionally. Um, I actually, in, 19, in my 1981 stint, I, my, my, Boss was Paul Allen officially. I mean, he's he's the guy that did my review. Um, in fact, I remember um, I had when I started work for them, 
it was it was agreed that I would I could still consult for Seattle computer so while I was consulting for Seattle computer I designed an IBM compatible plug-in card a memory and serial port together um, because you know there weren't very many slots and so you needed to combine functions this is before the four function card so we had the Seattle computer had the first two function card and then it turned out that Microsoft was coming out with a memory card or something too and so I remember my uh, my during my review it's like hey I designed a product that competes sorry about that <laughs> and it's like well okay don't do it again but uh, so Bill and Paul I mean they're people I can call by their, by their first name um, I, I mean I, I run into them after I left even at like charity events and things but I don't I don't know them personally particularly and uh, um, you know, shake hands. Hi, Bill. Hi, Paul. And uh, that's about as far as that goes. Anything else? Okay. Thanks for thanks for listening.